Welcome again to the NASCA 2011 Winter Webinar Series. We hope that you found these webinars to be interesting and informative. This webinar is the last one in the series for 2011. Our speakers today are Dr. James Lamondia, who's going to be talking about nematodes and root rots, and Dr. Richard Cowles, who will be discussing advances in root weevil management. Both are from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Just a few housekeeping things before we start. If you're interested in viewing the recorded webinars, if you look in the web links uh, box over here, you'll see webinar archive. If you click on that, you'll see a URL appears in the browse to box. Just click on that and it will open in a window behind uh, this window and all of the recorded webinars will be there for you to uh, access later. The other thing is we're interested in having some feedback from you about the series and so we have a short five question online survey. This will help us determine the effectiveness of this type of program, what you liked about it, what you may not have liked about it, and then possible topics of interest for a future series uh, hosted by NASCA. And if you click on again in the web link box on the exit survey, you'll find the URL there and you can just browse there and it should take you maybe five minutes at the most to complete the survey for us. In terms of NASGA and their uh, hosting of the Winter Webinar Series, we wish to thank you very much, uh, NASGA, for uh, hosting the series. And there's some membership information for you uh, that we hope you'll look through. Uh, why would you consider joining an association like NASGA? What what are the membership benefits to that? And then a membership application blank. And those are in the uh, file share box in the bottom right side of your screen. We did have some people registering even today for this last webinar. And so I'll just give a brief reminder of the uh, options that you have. If you're interested in, in commenting or asking a question in the bottom of the screen, you'll see what's called the chat box. And you can type in that long white box and then either hit the little uh, dialog icon or hit enter and it will be posted to everyone who's participating. Up on the top of your screen you see a little icon of a person with their hand raised. There are several options under that drop down menu. Um, you could agree or disagree with a comment that the speaker is making. You can ask them to speak louder or softer, to slow up or go faster. Uh, if they say something funny you can pick the smiley face for laughter and uh, clapping hands for applause. All right, I believe we're ready to begin. Our first speaker today is Dr. James Lamondia. Jim is a plant pathologist, nematologist, and the chief scientist at the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station Valley Laboratory in Windsor, Connecticut. Jim earned his BS in biology from Fitchburg State College in Massachusetts, and MS and PhD degrees in plant pathology plant pathology from Cornell University. His research interests are biology and control of plant diseases caused by nematodes and fungi. Areas of emphasis include non-chemical control such as plant resistance and cropping systems. Jim has 25 years of experience researching strawberry diseases. We're very fortunate to have Jim with us today. Jim? Hi. Good afternoon everybody. Can you hear me Kathy? Yes. Okay, we'll get started. So what I'm going to talk about are uh, these nematodes and root rots that occur on strawberries. Um, often strawberry root diseases, whether they're nematodes or fungi or anything else, um, that we sort of uh, come at this because the plants are doing poorly or they're dying and we really don't see anything visible on the foliage. So uh, what we need to find out is what are the problems and then how do we deal with them. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about some of these root rots and then talk about nematodes and then talk about black root rot where it's a combination of nematodes and, and fungi and just then how we can try to deal with some of these things. Um, the most common ones are probably red steel, pythium, and black root rot. And I'll go through those sort of in order here. In addition, we have lesion nematodes and root knot nematodes. This is the root knot on strawberries. Uh, particularly in the, the northeast and in Canada, um, uh, temperate areas are Meloidogyne hapla, and I'll talk about that as well. 
And then because disease really doesn't occur on its own uh, in, in, a, in a vacuum, we have to consider the environmental effects of this. Uh, stresses to the plants that can increase disease, such as compaction, uh, too much or too little water, uh, stressful pHs, and then nutrient uh, too much or too little. And again, that all kind of comes into this uh, disease triangle. Whenever a plant pathologist gives a talk, I, we're required to, to, give, to show this slide, I think. Uh, we have to have a susceptible plant. Uh, rather than the resistant type, um, a causal agent, which is the pathogen that we're trying to deal with, and it may be multiple. Uh, disease always doesn't occur on a, you know, pure cultures. And then the environment that the plant and the pathogen are interacting in. So, go to the first disease, red steel. Uh, the symptoms of this, and, and the symptoms of most of these root diseases, as I said before, are just sort of poor vigor, the tops are dying back, stunting, uh, the plants are under stress and having problems, and the diagnosis is uh, something we need to do. So under cool conditions, um, when, you, when you dig these plants up and look at them, you can find red vascular tissue, which is where the common name red steel comes from. Um, you don't always see this. And if it's a uh, little later in the summer, about harvest time, uh, as it's warming, often that symptom disappears. And you just see um, a sort of a rat tail root rot symptom. And the, the pathogen has persisted in the soil for years. Now, under the right conditions, you can see the, uh, this, this reddish vascular tissue. You can just sort of peel this back with your thumbnail or sometimes with a knife. Um, and you can notice that the cortex here is nice and white. Uh, the vascular tissue is where the disease is occurring, and it's, and it's dying. Um, now, in the, in the bottom left here, you can see this uh, oospore, and this is the reason why this pathogen can be persistent in the soil for years and years, even in the absence of a host. These are thick-walled resting spores. Um, this is a water mold that produces these oospores. It's a sexually produced spore, and they can persist under tough conditions for a long period of time. So once it's present in the field, you can count on it almost always being there. Now, water molds produce multiple kinds of spores. They produce those resting spores. That's the long-term type of spore. They also produce uh, sporangia, which can act as a, let me show you right here in the middle, this is this sporangia here. This is sort of a lemon-shaped spore that can act almost like a, a seed. It can germinate directly under, um, under conditions where it's water is, the, there's an excess of water, the soil pores are flooded. They often re-differentiate and produce zoospores. And you can see that I have the little black arrows here as well pointing at Zoospores, and if you look at, uh, use your imagination here, you can imagine that there are multiple, zo lots of zoospores swimming around in this. Now, these actually have flagella, and they can swim, and they chemically are attracted to strawberry roots. So that you can imagine under, under wet conditions, uh, flooded conditions, instead of a single sporangium that's germinating and causing disease, you get a little cluster bomb effect, where now you've got 20 to 40 zoospores that come out of this and then swim through the flooded soil pores attracted to the strawberry roots. So that's one of the reasons why um, flooded conditions are so damaging for, for this particular disease. As I said, it's a water mold, uh, severe under wet conditions. So some of the things we can do about this are to improve drainage, grow plants on raised beds, tile fields, do whatever needs to be done, avoid compaction and plow pans, which can also increase uh, flooding in the uh, root zone. Uh, resistant cultivars. There are a number of different cultivars. I've listed a few here. If you go to the Cornell information, there's a lot of different places where you can look at different varieties. And varieties will have some level of resistance to uh, Phytophthora fregari. In addition, some of the fungicides may help reduce disease in combination with resistance or environmental changes. It's difficult to rely only on fungicides alone. Uh, some of the fungicides are uh, Aliette type, uh, Ritamil, um, and then the, the phosphorus acid phosphate. Another water mold that can attack the roots is uh, Pythium root rot. This is one that occurs in a lot of different places. There's a lot of different species probably that even attack strawberries. It's common in vegetables. It's common in, in many soils all over, uh, all over North America. And what you can see here are these you know, large numbers of these oospores, again, in the roots. Now, the symptoms of pythium root rot are sort of a watery rot of the, of the root. 
they tend not to be as dramatic as the Phytophthora, uh, pardon me, as, as the Phytophthora fergarii, or even as uh, black root rot, which we'll talk about in a little bit. They tend to be more root nibblers. They take out the fine feeder roots, um, and again, under cool, wet conditions, stressed plants. So some of the same um, management tactics that you can use for Phytophthora fergarii also apply to Pythium, improving drainage, reducing compaction, growing on beds, that sort of thing. And then some of the same fungicides may be helpful. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of the nematodes. Some of these nematode problems on, on strawberries, I think, are often under-recognized. Uh, the northern root knot nematode, Moetigine hapla, is more common, I think, than people realize. Uh, it causes galls on roots, but these galls sometimes are fairly short-lived. You can see here, these are actually clusters of, of multiple galls. This, this area here has probably five or six different galls. There's an area here. If you look at this larger area from in this sort of quadrant here, there's probably 25 galls in this cluster of the root. Um, they also cause roots to be to branch more commonly than they would normally do, and so we get these hairy root symptoms. Now, the galls for northern root knot nematode are much smaller than those that you see in the books for the southern root knot nematodes. You see the large galls and you know pictures on tomatoes and all. These tend to be fairly small, and because strawberry roots can be a little woodier, uh, they're even smaller on strawberry, not as obvious as they are on some other crops. Now, nematodes are plant parasitic roundworms. Uh, there's a number of different kinds. The northern root knot nematode is one that it's called an endoparasite, sedentary endoparasite. They uh, are, there are eggs, you can see here, that, that develop, if I get the pointer at it, that develop into juveniles. The juveniles go into the root. They cause the root to establish feeding cells, which act as transfer cells, so that they're um, the same kind of cells that pump nutrients into fruit, except in this case, they're taking the nutrients and giving it to the nematode upon which you know, it feeds. And as a result, they increase in size fairly dramatically. This would be a juvenile here. Um, and they increase in size to these large females, which are essentially egg-laying machines. They go through several molts. And then the females produce an egg mass that's about the same size as the females, so they're very fecund. They tend to infect at the root tips. So you can see multiple juveniles stained red here in the root tip on the inset. Then uh, the root tip itself tends to stop growing, it gets swollen, and as a result of that, you often get branching. So you get these little uh, areas where you get bare stems being produced and branching coming out, hence the hairy root symptom. Over time, uh, as the root continues to, continues to grow, you can get multiple females being produced from that what was, once, was, once was the root tip. So you have the a female actually inside the root here another one over here, and then two more on this side. Now, this area is the egg mass that's being produced. So when you look again at the inset here, you have this white, creamy colored female. This is the uh, head end down here at the, at the very top. And then underneath is the egg mass. Again, this is uh, several hundred eggs, uh, which when you think about this, she's producing more eggs than, than her own body mass. So um, I mentioned HAPLA tends to be more common than we realize. It, it infects a lot of agronomic crops, almost all vegetables, small fruit, things like soybean, clover, a lot of broadleaf weeds. Uh, some of the more common ones are the purslane, plantain, dandelion, you can read here. However, all grain crops are non-host for Melodigine HAPLA, so that gives us an idea of what we can do for rotation. Uh, possibility there is to, to rotate with a grain crop. Now, one of the things when we, when we try to get uh, rid of, of these nematodes with grain crops is it's often difficult to get all the, the strawberry crowns out of the field or the broadleaf weeds. And if those hosts of the nematode continue to survive in the field, they will be a source of inoculum. And again, these nematodes increase so quickly because they produce so many eggs that um, it can be difficult if, if you don't get these out to, to control by rotation. And then finally, fumigation, but that's getting to be tougher and tougher to do um, as more regulations come in and make it harder to fumigate. Lesion nematode is very common. It's probably the most common uh, nematode in the Northeast in Canada. Protolanchus penetrans is the one we see the most. This is a, a vermiform 
uh, nematode. It's a it's a migratory endoparasite. It does not produce the fem the large females like the root knot does. These go into the roots, migrate through the cortex, and cause lesions, like you can see here. Now this happens to be a soybean root, and you can see these chocolate brown lesions where the nematode has moved through. Soybean is actually a pretty good indicator of um, nematode infection in the field, and we can use this for a bioassay. And in fact, uh, worked at uh, Georgia Bowie at Cornell has done uh, is using uh, using these as a way for growers to evaluate the level of lesion nematodes in their field, uh, and that may be something that we can talk about in the future at some time. Now these nematodes also go inside the root; they migrate through the cortex, and you can see the the, the juveniles and the adults stained red here. You can also see the eggs that they lay as they move along. Uh, they don't produce egg masses. They just lay them as they go in the uh, roots or in the soil. And as they move, they cause damage. They're feeding on the cell contents and moving through the cells. These nematodes, as I mentioned, are very common in, the, in, in our area. Um, they can attack almost, almost every plant you can think of in, in many respects. Uh, over 550 species of, of agronomic crops and weeds, and there's probably more that we haven't looked at yet. Now, the grain crops that you're growing for control of Moedogyne hapla are almost all hosts for uh, Protolanchus penetrans. So if you're, you, you do need to know what the nematode problem is before you try to control it by rotation. So we want to talk a little bit about what these nematodes do in terms of, other than direct damage, they are involved in, a, in another root rot disease uh, called black root rot. This is one that has a complex uh, cause. Uh, multiple organisms. Uh, for us, the most common one is the fungal problem that causes the root rot is this binucleate Rhizoctonia, Rhizoctonia frigeri, very common in strawberries. It's associated with um, vascular, or pardon me, a, a cortical root rot, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a second here. And then the lesion nematodes and stress also increase disease. Now again, the symptoms of this are pretty nondescript, and hence the common name. The plants are dying, they decline over time. The longer you have a field in production in strawberries, the more likely it is to be a problem with uh, black root rot. Be clicking two here at a time. Um, and when you dig these plants up, you can see that the, the plant on the left has this, has root rot. You'll see, you know, black roots, um, actually fewer roots as well compared to the healthy plant on the right or healthier plant on the right. So when you look at those, look more closely at those at those roots, you can see that there's a cortical root rot. So the pathogen is causing the, the cortex to die. And if you slice that open, you can differentiate between this and a disease like red steel because now the, um, the cortex is dying and turning black and rotting, um, coming just away sometimes again with a similar rat tail type of symptom. But when you look at the vascular tissue, it remains white for a period of time. Now, eventually, that's all going to die, and the, and the plant just, the roots just rot away and disappear, turn mushy. As I mentioned, the pathogen that, that causes the root rot symptom is this Rhizoctonia frigeri, very similar to the, uh, the Rhizoc on vegetables. Um, but um, it, again, it's a binucleate rather than multinucleate. And there are different anastomosis groups. And you see, I have a chart here of what what happens when we come. We did experiments in growth chambers, looking at different uh, isolates of the the pathogenic fun fungus, Rhizoctonia, and the anastomosis groups A, G, and I. Um, these tend to differ a little bit in their pathogenicity and how they do at certain temperatures. And you can see there's no no scale here, but the, there's a, the three boxes across the front are where we have just the Rhizoctonia alone with no nematodes, the zero here, or with a low level. And this is, under these conditions, we're getting 25, 30, 40% root rot, or a higher level. Um, these are what we would consider to be damaging levels of lesion nematodes, the kind we see mostly in the, the populations that we would see in the field that are causing stunting. So root rot goes from 30 to 35% here to about 70 to 80% when we add the, the lesion nematodes as well. So they do interact and increase the amount of disease caused by the Rhizoctonia. So what are the effects that we're seeing? We did other experiments here. That, uh, again, no pathogens, none. 
the Rhizoctonia frigarii alone or the Rhizoctonia plus Pratolinchus penetrans, the PP. And you can see again, black root rot increases, um, even 10% with none. And there probably is some Rhizoctonia in the nuns. It's sometimes difficult to get strawberries with absolutely no Rhizoctonia frigarii. But where we have the pathogen, where we have inoculated, we get 22% root rot, more than double it when we have the Rhizoctonia in combination with the, with the nematode. Now, in addition to visible disease that we're seeing on the roots, we see reduced length both in structural roots and in feeder roots. So the roots that are rotting tend to disappear, and we have a smaller root system. And over time, that smaller root system, not, not so healthy root system, uh, results in a decline um, in this, this, this uh, lack of vigor and, and uh, debilitating decline in the strawberries over, over time. Now, to talk about the root rot, I think we also need to talk about what root types we're talking about with strawberry here. Um, I, I'm going to talk about structural roots. These have both primary and secondary tissues with a well-developed cortex. The structural roots are the roots that you get uh, when the larger roots that you get with a, with a transplant. Those are the ones that are going into the ground. We also have perennial roots. Uh, healthy plants that are a couple of years old have, have very woody roots. These are primarily, these are mostly secondary tissues. These are woody tissues. There is no root cortex. It's gone. It's been sloughed off. And they have feeder roots that can come off these. So both structural roots and perennial roots have these um, soft primary tissue. By primary, I mean uh, um, non-woody tissues that uh, are these feeder roots. And these are pretty short-lived. And in the literature, they talk about some of the feeder roots cycling through about every uh, two weeks or so, which seems very quick. I'm having trouble here with, with moving one at a time. But uh, these are the structural roots. You can see that they are uh, these white tissues here. And they also have the feeder roots coming off them. When we do a cross-section of this, you can see that we have uh, a root with uh, the, the vascular tissue, a root cortex, and then the epidermis on the outside. So this is the cross-section of the, of the feeder roots, uh, pardon me, the structural roots. Now, those structural roots over time produce these secondary woody tissues. So we have vascular tissue on the inside, and you can see where this black arrow is, we're, we're getting uh, Secondary growth on the inside of this, this woody tissue in the cortex is to the left or to the outside of this. Now, over time, those roots will develop into these uh, perennial roots here. These are dark. In many cases, they're black roots. Often people think they're dead, but if you slice those open, they're, they're nice and white inside. And they have functional feeder roots. So when they are healthy, they will continue to, to be valuable to the plant. Now, if we take those perennial roots and cut them open, you can see it's almost like cutting open a, a tree trunk. You a very woody tissue. We've got uh, the vascular tissue, the xylem in here. Um, and this black area on the outside is what used to be the cortex. So as the, that, that secondary tissue grows from the inside out, it, it cuts off the cortex, and the, it essentially dies, and it's sloughed off and becomes this black outside of the perennial roots. And then the, the feeder roots that occur on both of these are very soft tissues. Um, no woody growth in them at all. Now the roots cycle over time. Uh, we, we get an increase in roots to about the time the plants fruit. They tend to go down over time, probably as a result of disease, and then come back again in the fall. And if we further split that up, we can see the, the, the green areas here are the, the white structural roots uh, that, again, go down during fruiting and then if they remain healthy, will turn into the black perennial roots with the yellow circles and increase over time again in the fall, as well as the white structure roots coming back again in the fall. Now, what do the nematodes do? So they get in, they cause these lesions, they cause cell death, they cause the collapse, which causes that necrotic spot. Um, you can see there are areas here where nematodes have moved right through the cortex. They, they move through the cells, feeding on the contents. Those cells die. Uh, you can see the phenolics and the discoloration that occurs around them and in those cells. Over time, that leads to this lesion where you get multiple cell death. Nematodes have probably moved through these cells here. 
and then around this that tissue dies and then seemingly the rhizoctonia moves into this. Now in addition to directly damaging cells in the literature and we've also seen we get discoloration of the endodermis. This, this ring that occurs around the, the vascular tissue that this is where the secondary growth starts becomes discolored and starts to be uh, again like it was cut open like the, the phenolics and we get early secondary growth. So the plants uh, recognize that they're being damaged and they, they produce perennial roots or on at least part of that root system faster. Now, so where are the nematodes in the, in the root system? Um, very few are in the perennial roots, the, no, not surprising. These are obligate parasites. They need living uh, tissue on which to feed. Those woody roots are tough for them to get into. If they do occur in perennial roots, it's probably in the feeder roots that are associated with those. Uh, they, are, they can be higher in number in the structural and then very common in the feeder roots. Very few are in the soil. If we have decent roots, uh, most of those nematodes are not going to be in the soil at all. They're going to be in the structure roots or the feeder roots. So that tells us uh, what kind of roots we should be taking if we're doing sampling to determine if we have nematodes in the field. And now, when do we sample? Uh, the, the, again, I mentioned these are obligate parasites. They need root tissue on which to feed. You think about what happens to the root tissue over time. It peaks in, in late May or so and then starts to decline. Um, the nematode populations do the same thing. They mirror the roots. As the roots are declining and dying, the, the nematodes either population crashes or they move off into the soil and become tougher to, to get back out. So the, the peaks are just before harvest. So that tells us not only where do we need to sample the feeder roots and the structure roots, but when, uh, late May. So rhizoctonia, this is the one, the, the organism that causes black root rot. Uh, gets into the cortex, digests that tissue. You can see the uh, manilioid cells here in the in, in the cortex. Uh, these are these are the this is the organism that causes the actual rot. So where where does this occur? Um, primarily in the in the perennial roots, um, in that sloughed cortex, I believe. So if we look at this in either in the spring um, or again after harvest. Uh, late June or so. Uh, in the spring, most of the rhizoctonia that we isolated, and we took a, entire root systems and cut them up into little two millimeter root sections and plated these all out and counted the percent infection. More than half of the perennial roots were infected with rhizoctonia frigaria initially. Uh, very little in the structural roots, uh, feeder roots, or even in what seemed to be lesion nematode areas. Now, as those plants uh, go through harvest, they're stressed. Uh, the level of infection of perennial roots goes very high, as do the level of infection uh, where lesion nematodes are present. So we wanted to look at what's going on here. We actually did some experiments where we did split roots. We took, a straw took strawberry crowns and split the root system in two so that we had half the root system in pot one, half in the second pot, and then inoculated either with both pathogens in, in different pots uh, both in the same pot here, or only the nematodes, or only the fungus. So this is just to give you a visual of uh, roots on either side. We either had the pathogens together or separately. Now, what happened for disease? Um, where we had the most disease was where we had both pathogens in the same pot. When both pathogens were present at the same level, but in different sides of the root system, uh, we did not have as much disease, and it was actually the same as if we had only one or the other. So it seems as though it is not a systemic effect, but uh, a localized effect. So what happens here? Um, I believe that the Rhizoctonia frigaria seems to be resident on strawberry roots. We've done a lot of sampling and a lot of strawberries over many years. Uh, it's, it's very common on the root system doesn't always cause disease. So we can find plants that are healthy. They will have rhizoctonia on them, uh, mostly on the surface, uh, primarily, again, on the perennial roots, but not necessarily causing disease. When we see secondary growth starting and the cortex dying, we get increased rhizoctonia infection. When we see nematode lesions, we get increased rhizoctonia infection. And I think the same is true with environmental stress. There's been a lot of cases where environmental stress increases black root rot. So again, 
root stress, problems with the roots. So what are the lesion nematodes doing? They cause this root damage directly by their feeding. Um, that results in wounded tissue that's probably more susceptible to the rhizoctonia. It also results in roots producing early secondary growth. So we have areas, limited areas in the root system where the secondary growth occurs, uh, those, those parts of the cortex are being cut off, and then they're senescing, and I think that's where the rhizoctonia moves in first. The areas of the root that have these, this dying cortex, um, that's the start, and it moves from there into the what would otherwise be healthy. So, lesion nematodes, uh, how common are these? We actually did a survey um, in Connecticut and a few years ago. Uh, we put this out, 25% of the growers thought that they had damaging populations of lesion nematodes. Uh, of that, most of those either fumigated, used a uh, nematicide like Nemecure or Furidan, which was labeled at the time, um, or sometimes did both. So the other 75% either didn't think they had a problem or were unaware that they had a problem um, or said, what's a lesion nematode? Now, lesion nematodes, we might actually went out and surveyed those fields after we did, this, uh, did the uh, analysis of asking the growers. Uh, we found them in 31 of the 41 fields we looked at. Four of the growers that had no problems, um, three of those fumigated with methobromide and, uh, or, and or telone. Um, so surprised that they, they, they actually thought they had damaging problems, maybe had in the past, but uh, uh, four of those fields, uh, three, three of the fields uh, didn't have any nematodes at all. Uh, the growers that were aware of the problem and others that were even unaware, three uh, that were thought they had problems and eight that were unaware that didn't uh, manage, all had damaging lesion nematode populations. So they're much more common than, than uh, people realized. They didn't recognize the problem. Um, probably, again, not surprising because there are no obvious symptoms other than uh, root lesions, which can be tough to see. Now, one of the things we found in our surveys is that people who rotated, uh, often with small grains, this did not affect the lesion nematode populations. It actually made it, in some cases, probably worse. So what are the impacts of nematodes? We, we had done some work looking at what nematodes do to reduce yields um, and found that if we adapted a, a model developed at Cornell by uh, Demery and Reichenberg, if there are no nematodes, this is 98 numbers. Uh, there was a profit of nearly $8,000 per acre over four years. But when we start getting up into damaging levels, which would be somewhere where we consider about 100 nematodes per gram of root as, as damaging, you can see we got a really significant loss in, in, in profitability. And we start getting above damaging levels, we actually had a, could predict a loss over four years. So this is not something that uh, anybody wants to deal with. So how do we manage black root rot? Uh, in the past, it had been done with fumigation. Broad spectrum fumigants, methobromide, um, uh, Orlex, things like that. Um, again, that becomes is becoming more difficult or impossible to do. Uh, you'll see a lot, a lot of times in recommendations to use rotation, but the question is with what and for how long? Um, Sanitation, planting clean crowns. We did some work with uh, fertilizers, and ammonia was better than nitrate fertilizers, but gave us about 10% reduction, and then control of lesion nematodes. We also tried to do some work with fungicides, seeing if we could use a dip or a drench. Again, Rhizoctonia frigeri is pretty common. It can even be found in healthy crowns from nurseries. So we thought if we could break that association, that would help. Uh, did a bunch, looked at a number of different fungicides, uh, and then isolated from the root system. We also evaluated on, uh, on auger plates to see if we saw inhibition in, in media. Um, oh, pardon me. We found that some had activity, some in vitro, meaning in the plates, some uh, on the plants. But uh, at this point, this is work that more work needs to be done to find out what, what we might be able to use that would be more effective. And some of the newer fungicides we need to test again. Uh, I'm sure Rich will talk a little more about this, but we've been working on resistance or tolerance to black root rot. Um, that's one possibility, and there are some varieties that seem to be more affected than others. Um, and again, I think he will speak to this a little bit. Finally, uh, cover crops. You know, what do we grow and for how long? If you look here, uh, this is a, a graph of reproductive factor. Uh, final population over the initial, so it's essentially an increase. 
uh, how much does it multiply over time. Hairy vetch increases by seven times. So if you start off with 100 nematodes, you probably end up with 700 over one season. Mustard actually increases. Rapeseed, two and a half times. Start getting down into uh, uh, sorgo sudan grass like true dan eight and then down into rye grass, uh, we get less of an increase. Now, not only do we have to just grow these plants, but if you can grow them as a green manure and incorporate them, some of these plants produce chemicals which can be toxic to the nematodes, uh, allelopathic, if you will. So hairy vetch obviously doesn't have these properties. The prop this is a great host for for lesion nematodes, as is alfalfa. Um, some of the grains, but when we start getting down to the Sudex, the Sargo Sudan grass, the rapeseed, rye grass, and mustard, you can see that the populations are not as high. So you do get a biofumigation or, or a allelopathic effect. Now, in addition, we've been working on um, there's a Canadian forage pearl millet. We have a uh, we did some work here at the Valley Laboratory, uh, looking at buckwheat, uh, dwarf Essex brassica, which is one that was a high glucosinolate used for uh, biofumigation. Velvet bean was used down south, and then Sargo Sudan grass, and again this Canadian forage pearl millet. And what we found was that the Sudan grass and the and the millet actually had the best efficacy for green manures, much better even than the dwarf Essex brassica, which uh, supposedly is a biofumigant. But unfortunately, it's also a host of the nematode, so that it can increase it uh, in the root system, and then when you you chop it down and turn it under. That you're trying to knock down a population you just increased. So at that, I think I will stop. And uh, uh, Kathy, do, do we have any time for questions? Yes, we have time for a couple. Uh, Rich is asking Jim that you would explain anastomosis group to the to the folks okay, listening. Okay. Well, um, uh, Rhizactonia has uh, these different anastomosis groups. These are anastomosis is uh, fusion. So these are these are uh, wide groups that are that are very similar. So that essentially what the Rhizoctonia does is it recognizes other isolates as itself and it will will fuse hyphae and exchange genetic information. So if um, if you have very similar isolates, they are in the same anastomosis group, these hyphae fuse. Um, if they are different enough that they no longer recognize each other, they're in a different anastomosis group. So that's one way of saying uh, uh, related strains. Okay, are there other questions for Jim? Okay, when I use the term radish, is that oilseed radish? Um, yes, we have been doing some work with oilseed radish. Uh, that's, um, we're doing this in microplots, that's un in, in, um, underway. And um, uh, I, I, I can't really speak as to how well that's, that's working yet. Other questions? Well, thanks, Jim. And you can think about questions for Jim. He'll be back with us at the end of the program. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Richard Cowles. Rich obtained his degrees in entomology from Cornell and Michigan State University. After completion of his doctoral degree, he worked for four years as statewide extension and research turf and ornamental specialist at the University of California, Riverside. Since 1994, Rich has been a research entomologist at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station and is also stationed at the Valley Laboratory in Windsor. His areas of study include managing pyrethroid resistance, use of systemic insecticides, integrated pest management, and breeding strawberries for resistance to black root rot and black vine weevils. Rich? Okay, I'm here. Let me switch to your presentation. Well, right. good afternoon, everybody. Let's see. I just need to do a little adjustment here first. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? All right, there we go. Excellent. A little bit of an overview for my presentation. <clears throat> I'll go over the life cycle for 
root weevils and go over some field observations for um, how these root weevils damage strawberry plantings. And I'll go into some practical approaches to manage root weevils in strawberries. <clears throat> we have a number of um, species of importance throughout the United States, of which black vine weevil is present across the country, along with some of the smaller root weevil species. The smaller, um, the strawberry root weevil and rough strawberry root weevil are, are found throughout the country too. Black vine weevil is about half an inch long in body length. That's a black vine weevil. Whereas the strawberry root weevil, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the strawberry root weevil and rough strawberry root weevil are about half that size. The leaf weevil is a, a brilliant green color, and unlike the Odiorhynchus species, which are the black vine weevil and these other uh, strawberry and rough root, strawberry root weevil, and the leaf weevil, which is bright green. Uh, reproduces sexually. And then in the Pacific Northwest, there may also be other root weevils, which thankfully we don't have in New England, such as a clay colored weevil. The life cycle of black vine weevil, if you were to go out right now, probably anywhere in the country, you'd find overwintering pupae and also overwintering adults. Uh, black vine weevil and all of the root weevils, uh, pretty much, uh, are long-lived, and the adults can live for more than one year. This is of great concern, because sometimes those weevils that are overwintering as adults may start feeding and laying eggs far ahead of the generation that emerges during the summer. But you should have mostly overwintering pupae, and when the soil temperatures these are the pupae here. Let's see. Okay. When the soil temperatures reach about 55 degrees Fahrenheit, th that triggers development of um, the overwintering, excuse me, the larvae are overwintering <laughs> over here. When the soil temperatures reach about 55 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, that triggers them to develop to the intermediate stage, uh, the pupae, where they complete development and emerge at about the time that there are strawberries starting to ripen um, in the field. The adults feed extensively on the edges of the leaves for about three to four weeks, at which time they are able then to start laying eggs. Eggs are initially white, and within a few days they develop to this um, yellowish-brown color which indicates that they're uh, developing properly. This feeding along the edges of the strawberry leaves is especially important for, it's important for a number of reasons, one of which is that it, it provides a very excellent way for you to go out and monitor in your fields to determine where you have uh, black vine weevil infestations, or any of the other root weevils will cause the same sort of leaf notching. The other thing of concern with, with the feeding activity is that where you have a lot of feeding, that implies that the weevils will be able to convert that foliage into eggs. And if you look at this particular field, in this area right here, we had fixed set irrigation, and when the grower went through and renovated by mowing off the foliage in that particular field, uh, that was at the time when the weevils were just about ready to start laying eggs. So you can imagine the season before, they mowed the foliage, they could not mow where there was this irrigation because of the risers, they couldn't take the mower over it. And the weevils from the entire field were then concentrated right where the irrigation pipe was. They continued feeding, started laying their eggs where the foliage was still present in the field, and then they moved outward from that site. 
So in looking across the field, I could see in the fall these rows of strawberries where the uh, pipes were turning red. And there was less damage, but it, there was a very strong gradient from that, that particular row and across the field. And then the next irrigation pipe would look just the same as this. So where you have extremely uh, tasty foliage available to the adults, that's where they will be feeding, and that's where they will be laying eggs. And then consequently, that's where root damage will be occurring. The um, leaf notching within the field is a very useful measure. What we did with surveys is that we went uh, throughout Connecticut and we took samples of 100 leaves in every strawberry field that we uh, could find, pretty much. We took the 100 leaf sample at random. And then we sat down and we counted the percentage of those leaves that had any signs of notching, which presumably would be from root weevil adult feeding. And the numbers of fields that had a certain percent of leaf notching then formed this histogram. So <clears throat> we had a large number of fields with 50% or less notching. And a few fields that were very severely affected, these are ones in which the growers would have seen extreme damage. Although there was only one field out of the total of something like 42 fields or so. that had, um, there was only one field out of the 18 in this histogram that had no signs of any leaf notching. And so it, it tells me that black vine weevil infestations through fields in Connecticut are widespread. Practically every field of strawberries will have some root weevil activity. It's extremely rare to find any field that has no root weevils. There are only about a quarter of the fields that have uh, infestations heavy enough to require uh, doing some sort of management. <clears throat> and in doing our surveys, we found that there were uh, considerable varietal, varietal differences. Uh, so certain varieties, such as All Star or Annapolis, would be looking pretty good. And yet, neighboring varieties such as Kent or Honey Oil would be dis destroyed by black vine weevil. This led to rather an intensive uh, a project in comparing commercial strawberry varieties to see um, whether there were genetic, whether there was genetic variation that would allow us then uh, allow growers to um, uh, to plant uh, varieties that had some level of resistant to resistance to root weevils. One of the methods that I used was to take uh, leaf discs from different varieties of strawberries. It was just punched out with a cork borer, place them in a petri dish with a weevil, and then allow the weevils to feed overnight. And some of the things that contribute to variation in, in the palatability of strawberries to black vine weevil are the uh, degree of uh, how many leaf hairs they have, and there are other uh, features of the strawberry leaves too. However, there are quite major differences amongst strawberry varieties in their palatability to um, black vine weevil, and this can be an important thing to use for um, finding resistance. Another aspect that I looked at was to see whether the uh, root systems for these strawberry varieties differed in how well they would support black vine weevil larval development. And of the 21 cultivars that I looked at, there, were no, there was no variation. The larvae developed um, equivalently on all 21 cultivars. So it's really the foliage uh, differences that are leading to uh, variations that we see in the field in damage.
<clears throat> That's not to say that root characteristics aren't important, though, related to survival of the strawberry plants. And I think the way to look at this is that there are very likely interactions with root pathogens. So if we have uh, cultivars that are susceptible to black root rot and have, as a consequent, consequence of, of root rot, very few roots, functional roots, those are varieties then that cannot tolerate additional root weevil feeding on those root syst systems. The plants simply then collapse. So if we wish to have <clears throat> a program in which we're using um, plant resistance, we need to have a breeding program in which we jointly improve root disease and root weevil tolerance. The idea here being that if we can have a strawberry plant that grows really extensive root systems, that they'll be able to tolerate both black root rot and black vine weevil or other root weevil larval feeding without compromising the ability of the plant to obtain sufficient water, nutrients, and, um, and then be able to provide a good crop. <clears throat> so black root rot is important because uh, even though weevil feeding doesn't increase black root rot incidence, black root rot will remove the amount of root tissue that functions and it increases the injuriousness of additional root loss. <clears throat> now both Jim and I did screening trials with commercial varieties of, of strawberries to see uh, what their what the variation was amongst them for susceptibility to root rots and to root weevils. And I was able to determine that uh, the leaf hair and nitrogen characteristics uh, would affect feeding. And there were some other variety, uh, some other factors involved too. And um, the idea behind my breeding program has been to hybridize the superior varieties that would have both some tolerance of black vine weevil and some tolerance to root rots to per, uh, permit directional selection to improve the, ver um, the favorable traits. You can think about this <coughs> in terms of animal breeding, where we had um, you know, ancestrally some, something like a wolf and selective breeding for a larger size animal uh, would lead to the Great Dane, and selection for a smaller animal leads to a ch chihuahua, but they started with the same ancestry. And we could do the same sort of process with selective breeding with strawberries by simply pl planting those strawberries in an environment where there is extreme root disease uh, presence, and then only taking those survivors that fruit well and using them as parents for the next generation. <coughs> Using this approach, uh, we've come up with a variety uh, that's shown on the left uh, called Rubicon that should be um, released probably in 2012. It's, being na it's named now and it is undergoing patenting. Um, that's from um, our own breeding program. And there's another variety that comes from uh, British Columbia from a cross made in 1994 called Stolo, that is, uh, the claim is that it is resistant to black vine weevils. And so uh, it will be very interesting to compare these two new varieties to see how well they perform, where there's a high degree of root disease and black vine weevils. <clears throat> For managing root weevils, there are uh, uh, really three two or three major approaches. I'll start out with biological control, of which uh, really the only commercialized um, tool that's been uh, tested has been the use of insect pathogenic nematodes. I'll mention predatory ground beetles um, as we proceed, because there are some other practices that may impact their effectiveness in suppressing black vine weevil populations. Insect pathogenic nematodes, there are a number of species available. There are ones that are principally active in searching out uh, hosts near the surface of the soil. That would be Steinunema carpocapsi. And there are other species that, are, that dig deeply in the soil 
uh, they <coughs> move through the soil on a, a water film on the soil particles. Uh, Heterorhabditis species are the commercial varieties that are deeper, uh, that dig deeper into the soil. There are a number of advantages in working with nematodes, one of which is that they're exempt from uh, pesticide regulation because they're uh, a multicellular organism. They're not really considered to be pesticides. They're extremely safe for, to the environment. <clears throat> they don't cause uh, pollution of any sort. And uh, more importantly, I think, they're able to seek out their hosts. They move on their own to where the host is in the soil. And they're also able to multiply in the host. So you could have permanent establishment of these insect pathogenic nematodes in the soil that then would lead to uh, suppression of the weevil populations over a long period of time, multiple years. Here we have um, an image of an effective juvenile stage insect pathogenic nematode. It's only about half a millimeter long. And that's the stage of nematode that would be purchased from a commercial provider. Those are applied almost as you would apply a, an insecticide to the field, irrigated in to incorporate the nematodes and allow them to then move through the soil on the, under their own power. They seek out the host, and when they infect the host, this is a, a cutworm pupa here, they will go through a few generations of development within the host and then will exit the host in extremely large numbers. Those infect that next cycle of infective juvenile nematodes can then go through the soil and cause additional cycles of infection. One of the important things about um, these uh, nematodes that you need to understand is that they have mutualistic uh, bacteria that live within their guts. When the nematodes infect a soil-dwelling insect, one of the first things they do is that they release these bacteria into the hemocele or the body cavity of that insect. And then the bacteria multiply within the insect's body. And what we have here is a petri dish in which there were the mutualistic bacteria uh, placed on the agar plate. And it's showing that, the, that there is a zone of inhibition, meaning that those bacteria are producing antibiotics that protect uh, inside the insect, protect it from being colonized by fungi or anything else that might compete with the ability of that, the nematodes to complete development. These bacteria can have distinctive colors. So <clears throat> when we look at um, uh, black vine weevil larvae that have been infected by um, insect pathogenic nematodes, they'll take on the color of the bacteria. Uh, the bacterial mutualistic uh, mutualists that are found with the nematodes. The <clears throat> black vine weevil on the right was infected with a Steiner Pneuma species. The one in the center was infected with a heteroabdited nematode, which will, would cause the larva to turn a reddish or, or brown color. And the larva on the right is a healthy black vine weevil. I've done field trials with insect pathogenic nematodes, and this is showing the results. It's a, an assessment in the fall of how many larvae there were in a sample of two plants. And the dates that are given on, on the x-axis are the dates of application for the insect pathogenic nematodes. So in early May application, when we came back in October and checked, we had a very low number of larvae around those root systems. As we progress through the field season to June and then to August, the percent reduction of the uh, larvae around the root system compared to the untreated check was insignificant. The explanation I have for this, these dynamics are as follows that when we do an early May application of nematodes, the 
significance of this arrow here is application of nematodes and the timing. Those overwinter larvae and perhaps the pupae that are present in the soil might be infected to the degree of 30 to 40 percent of the population. That doesn't do a whole lot for reducing the black vine weevil population. However, what it does do is allow the nematodes to develop to the point where there will be infective juvenile nematodes present in the soil at great no large numbers when the next generation of eggs of the weevils would be hatching. And so there'd be 90% or greater uh, infection of that uh, population of weevil larvae in August or September. Some guidelines for using insect pathogenic nematodes. First, you should make sure that the soil is moist. If you do apply nematodes, apply them with any kind of uh, liquid application uh, spray equipment. I would suggest, though, because nematodes are very expensive, to use a boom sprayer, probably band the nematodes onto the, onto the row, <clears throat> as narrow a band as possible. Do not use a piston pump because that shears the nematodes and will kill them. And then you can even apply irrigation while spraying the nematodes to, to provide an opportunity to move the nematodes immediately into the soil where they be, be protected from um, sunlight. One of the great challenges is people trying to apply these nematodes on a sunny day. Uh, nematodes will only survive for a couple minutes in, in the sunlight. Typical guidelines are to apply about 1 billion per treated acre. Now, of course, if you're banding them on, that means that you might only be treating essentially half or one third of the total area of the field. So that means that you would only need to buy uh, proportionately that much, many fewer nematodes to treat a field. Overall, the the um, results from various field trials and around the world has suggested that a, a fall application could even be more effective than a spring application timing. But in, in both instances, the so soil temperature needs to be uh, greater than 60 degrees. And generally speaking, the warmer the soil, the better these nematodes will perform. Not only will the nematodes be able to move through the soil faster at higher soil temperatures, but the bacteria that are associated with the nematodes will multiply in the infected hosts much faster with warmer temperatures. And it's the multiplication of those bacteria that actually kill the insect host. We've done field sampling throughout Connecticut and uh, uh, looking in growers' fields for the presence of insect pathogenic nematodes. And one of the surprises for me was to compare fields in which nematodes had never been applied, <clears throat> in which there were eight fields where we found insect pathogenic nematodes, and then 39 fields that had none, and compare that to fields where we had purposefully applied commercially available nematodes. And, uh, about uh, six fields out of eight or, or three quarters of the, the fields, we were able to recover insect pathogenic nematodes. Probably one of the more important messages here is that insect pathogenic nematodes are found in our soils. And if they're given an opportunity to infect root weevils, they do. And that uh, can be an important uh, way to suppress weevil populations. Generally speaking, commercial a application of commercially available insect pathogenic nematodes has been kind of so-so in terms of suppression of weevil populations. And I think that there are a number of problems, one of which is uh, that the commercially available nematodes may be of questionable quality compared to those populations that we find naturalized in our soils. Um, so basically, they're great if they're already there. But because of the requirements for warm soils, and uh, there's really is a great degree of interference if there's uh, a significant clay content in the soil, um, 
There are very specific conditions under which these nematodes can work well to suppress root weevils. And generally speaking, they're, they've only been mediocre. If we move on to chemical control, there are basically two strategies. If you remember uh, in <clears throat> the introduction for this talk, I, I told you that uh, black vine weevil, weevils will feed for about three to four weeks before they are able to start laying eggs. This has been considered in the past to be uh, a, a great window of opportunity in which we might be able to kill the adults um, and interrupt the life cycle before they have any opportunity to start laying eggs. And the other approach would be to kill the lar larvae while they are feeding on the root systems. Interestingly, for strawberries, the strategy for uh, several decades has been to kill the adults Whereas when you look at other crop systems, such as uh, nursery crops, it's pretty well recognized that targeting the larvae has been much more successful in managing um, root weevils. One of the reasons why this might be the case is when you think about black vine weevil, the, f the plants, uh, the other plants on which they feed, are some notoriously uh, poisonous plants, such as uh, taxus on the left or rhododendron on the right. And so black vine weevil are adapted to feed on many toxic plants, and this suggests that they have um, a, a really well-developed suite of detoxification enzymes may predispose them to be able to detoxify various insecticides that we're using to try to kill them. <clears throat> I tried an approach of targeting the larvae this past year in a field trial, and I compared it with uh, the standard approach of applying Brigade. Now, for those growers in Canada, the equivalent would be to target the adults with um, Matador, which is Lambda Sahelithrin. Uh, Brigade is Bifenthrin and, uh, Bifenthrin and Lambda Sahelithrin, which is the active ingredient of Matador, are, are very similar in their properties. They're broad spectrum py pyrethroids. Um, so this is a comparison of <clears throat> Treatments that are targeting the larvae, actually adults or larvae, that's with a new insecticide called Corrigin, targeting the larvae only with platinum, or targeting just the adults with Brigade. And what's intriguing to me is that, um, oops, <laughs> is that the numbers of larvae for those treatments that were targeting the larvae were reduced by about half compared to the untreated check. Whereas for uh, the, the treatment with Brigade, which was targeting the adults, uh, the number of larvae were no different than the untreated checks. And this was reflected in the appearance of the strawberry plants in the field, too. And uh, what I'd like to point out to you is this patch of red foliage. That was the bifenthrin treated plot. And um, that's when I look at red foliage at the end of the season, that's a good indication of uh, damage to the root system and, the, and severe plant stress. And um, so it really suggests to me that the approach that we've been taking for many years in trying to target the adult weevils for control in strawberry fields is really rather misguided. One of the reasons why we might see um, an extreme amount of damage where we've applied bifenthrin or even a, a, or matador 
targeting the adults is that um, that would have tremendous consequences also in killing predator predators of various sorts, of which the most important would be predatory ground beetles. Here we have the adult and the adult and the larva, uh, both of which are really uh, ferocious predators of black vine weevil. <clears throat> Just an idea of the kind of dynamics that might be taking place are, are shown with um, some work that I did with field-grown nurseries in Connecticut. And what I'd like to do is compare the intensively managed uh, field, that's a column on the left, and the ratio of the predators, which are the carabids, to the uh, black vine weevils. In that nursery situation, the, that was sprayed intensively with pyrethroid insecticides, and it had a rather unfortunate effect of killing off the uh, the, the good guys and allowing the bad guys, the black vine weevils, to uh, persist. Whereas a field where the grower didn't even know that they had black vine weevils, they didn't spray at all, and uh, the poor black vine weevils in this field are subjected to about a 300 to 1 ratio of predators to themselves. So it suggests to me that targeting the adults of black vine weevils might be really misplaced. There are cultural practices that could also be useful, <clears throat> one of which has been tested in, in uh, Canada and the Ontario, uh, let's see, Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and, well, I can't remember the entire acronym, but the, this was published in 2006 by Tolman et al. What they're using is a plastic sheet with a few little uh, supports and that's uh, placed so that the bottom edge is in the soil. So if you have an old uh, strawberry field that's uh, heavily infested with weevils on one side, and, and a, a planting, a young planting on the other side, you'd be able to stop the weevils from wandering straight from one field to the other. And this, um, this barrier has, oops, sorry. The barrier has, right at the edge, a pitfall trap. So weevils that are crawling along the edge of the barrier, okay, they'll simply walk along the edge of the barrier, and then when they come to the end, they fall into the pit, pitfall trap. And when different types of barriers were compared, the uh, sheet barrier was found to catch a lot of the weevils, whereas a different type of barrier was not. But from a practical point of view, um, one of the things that we see commonly, with, especially with um, pick-your-own type operations, is that there's really limited space for planting strawberries. And growers are putting in fields of strawberries right next to old plantings that are heavily infested with weevils. And when the growers plow under those old plants, the weevils will simply go to where there's good vegetation. And so that means that they immediately invade the, the new planting, and you don't realize this until next year when you have uh, a severe infestation in the new planting. So the idea is to put in a, a barrier. That would be the plastic, uh, the plastic sheet that separates the two fields, and when you plow under the old plants, uh, have that barrier in place already, and have a collection pail right at the end of the barrier to um, pick up those adult weevils. In summary, uh, some of the things that you can do for root weevil management is to monitor your planting to determine uh, whether you have a problem. The easiest thing is to check to see whether you have stressed plants that have the red leaves turning uh, in the fall. Look for patches in your fields where the leaves turn red uh, ahead of the plants in the rest of the field. And then that could be caused by any number of things. Root weevils, white grubs, root diseases, nematodes. Um, so then you have to dig up some plants and take a look to see whether the roots are diseased or whether you have larvae associated with those damaged plants. 
And then the other tool that's very useful uh, for monitoring is to uh, look for leaf notching. And that you would do right at the end of harvest before you renovate and take a hundred leaf sample and count the number of leaves that have notches in them. If you have more than 50% of the leaves notched by weevils, that signifies that you have um, a, a high population that needs to be managed. I would suggest only considering insect pathogenic nematodes where, where conditions permit. Basically, a sandy soil and um, warm soil temperatures at the time of application of the nematodes. Consider planting tolerant varieties of strawberries, tolerant to both black root rot and to black vine weevil. And an interesting and important consideration is to limit the nitrogen application. Uh, nitrogen, excessive nitrogen conditions lead to um, <clears throat> much greater fecundity of the adult weevils. They're able to convert the foliage into eggs much more efficiently and so if you use excessive leaf nitrogen, that could lead to outbreaks of these weevils. Now, of the insecticides that I tested in the field, only one of which is uh, registered at this time for control of black vine weevil, and that's platinum. That's uh, the active ingredient is, is thiamethoxam. And I feel that that's uh, based upon both my work and work from the Pacific Northwest that that would be a, a good strategy. Um, I think that uh, the Corrigin product uh, also should be considered for registration for management of black vine weevil and other root weevils. It has extremely low mammalian toxicity, and so it would be um, uh, a really good tool for us to consider. And then lastly, use exclusion barriers to uh, prevent weevils from moving from currently infested fields to newly planted fields. That's my presentation, so I, I'll, I think I'll open it up to questions or uh, turn it over to Kathy. Questions for Rich or Jim? While we're waiting for those, I'm going to switch to the end screen, and I want to thank you again for participating in the NASGA winter webinar series and encourage you to go to the uh, website where we have a short five question survey to help us uh, get a feel for how well you enjoyed the series and what sorts of topics you would like to have in the next round. Okay, Kevin Schooley has a question for Rich. How would you handle or manage fields that are being removed? Rich? Rich, have you lost your audio? Okay, sorry about that. I, I, I couldn't hear anything because uh, it was echoing so badly in my ears. Uh, I turned my, uh, <laughs> my headset off except for the microphone. Yeah, related to uh, managing fields that are being removed, um, there are a couple problems here. One, is, one of which is that you may have really extreme number of root weevils um, in that field. There's no practical way to kill off the adults with uh, insecticides. Um, growers have tried using these pyrethroids right at the time that they finish harvest, uh, but that hasn't seemed to really 
do a tremendous amount of good. So really the exclusion barrier to protect nearby, um, nearby fields is one of the best ideas to come along in quite a while. There's a question from Gary Post. He's wondering if Corrigin is more effective than imidacloprid. Ah, great question. Uh, Corrigin is a, a different class of insecticides. Um, I think a better question might be comparing uh, platinum with imidacloprid. Platinum and imidacloprid are in the same class, and I've always seen very mediocre results of imidacloprid for targeting black vine weevil. In fact, Bayer got into quite a bit of trouble when they were trying to market use of imidacloprid for black vine weevil control in um, a special strawberry production system in England where they grew strawberries in pretty much like containers and they'd set them into a cooler and then they'd bring them out into a greenhouse to uh, force the flowering and fruit development. And of course it tried to use imidacloprid for black vine weevil control in that system found that they it didn't work well at all and they ended up with worse outbreaks and they switched over to using insect pathogenic nematodes. The thiamethoxam active ingredient in platinum seems to be a little bit more effective against these root weevils and so I think it has good promise there. And then Corrigin, I think, is probably equivalent to uh, the thiamethoxam or platinum for control of root weevils. Currently, though, it is not registered yet for control of root weevil larvae. Rather, its registration in strawberries, uh, that is for Corrigin, is for targeting uh, pests such as leaf rollers or other caterpillars, which is kind of strange because they're <laughs> I've never seen them to be important pests in strawberry fields. At least having Corrigin registered in any way on strawberries means that it ought to be a small step to take to obtain a label amendment that would allow it to be used for control of black fire weevil too. I've worked with that active ingredient, a celeprin, for targeting white grubs and it's spectacular against uh, white grubs and so I think that there might be a good uh, fit for targeting both white grubs and root weevils in strawberries with that new insecticide. <laughs> um, I haven't gone that far yet. I'll have to call up the company and ask if they'd be interested. Are there any other questions for either Jim or Rich? Well, thank you everyone for participating. And again, I would ask if you would please just take five minutes, go to the exit survey, and fill it out for us. We would be greatly appreciative. Have a wonderful strawberry season, and we hope you'll join us for the next webinar series. Thanks.